Hello, in this lecture, we're going to discuss evaluating limits analytically. And we're going to do several examples so that you can learn how to actually evaluate limits. So there is a general rule that you can use when evaluating limits. And this is not a rule that you typically see uh, written in books, but it's a rule that works and you just have to pay special attention to the wording. So the rule says if you can plug in the number. So if you can plug in the number when you're taking a limit and you get an actual answer, go ahead and do it. So if you can plug in the number and you get an answer, go for it. Now, by an answer, I mean something that actually makes sense, right? So you actually need to get a number. So if you get division by zero or something nonsensical, that's not going to work. You actually have to get uh, a real number. Uh, if it doesn't work, then you try something else. So if it doesn't work, so if it does not work, try something else. Try something else and that's really what it's all about it's what is that something else so in this lecture we're going to investigate different techniques that you can use for evaluating limits and we're just going to do a bunch of examples because i think that's the best way um, to learn calculus so let's just start with an example here and i'll just start by making one up say we have the limit as x approaches uh, the number one of parentheses, let's say 3x squared plus 4. So we're trying to find the limit of 3x squared plus 4 as x approaches 1. So our rule says if we can plug in the number, in this case the 1, into this uh, polynomial and we get an answer, go for it. Well, there's nothing here that says we can't plug in the number, right? We can certainly put the 1 here. Now, when you plug in the number, you're evaluating the limit, and that's when you drop the limit sign. We get three times one squared plus four. And so one squared is one, so this is three times one, which is just three, plus four, and it's equal to seven. Look at that, super easy. We're doing calculus, right? So it's really not that bad. So if you can plug in the number and you get an answer, go for it, that's the answer. You got this. Let's do another one. Let's just keep doing examples here. All right. Now I'm going to find one here that looks decent. I have a list of problems here. Um, how about uh, all of these are too easy. We need something harder. Uh, here we go. Here's a, here's a harder one. Limit as x approaches 0 of x squared plus 3x over x. It's still pretty easy. If you already know calculus, this is going to seem really easy. but there's a point to be made here. You see, if I plug in zero here, look what's gonna happen. Um, I drop the limit sign, and I get zero squared plus three times zero over zero. So you end up with zero over zero. That's no good, right? You cannot divide by zero, it's an epic fail. So what do you do? You have to do something else. So in this example, what we're going to do is we're going to factor. So this is the limit. And notice I'm writing the limit sign again. It's really, really important to always write that limit sign um, until you actually evaluate the limit. So in the numerator, we have x squared plus 3x. So you can actually pull out the x here. And let's see, what times x is going to give you x squared? Well, x, right? Because x times x is x squared. And then what times x is going to give you uh, 3x? So plus 3 all divided by x. And this is where the magic happens, right? The x's cancel. Boom. So this is equal to the limit as x approaches 0 of x plus 3. Very nice. And now we're in a place where we can actually plug in the limit. We can actually evaluate the limit. So this is where you drop the limit sign, you replace the x with a 0, and so we end up with the number 3. It's very, very important to structure your work. I want to emphasize that uh, one of the things that I've seen that people have a hard time with sometimes is 
they don't have the proper notation, it's really, really important to have correct notation. So write the limit sign, write the limit sign, write the limit sign. Don't write it because you plug it in. So here the technique we used was factoring. So factoring is a technique that is often used when evaluating limits analytically. So something to keep in mind when you're working on random problems, you know, if you're taking a test or you're just doing random problems from a book, uh, something worth doing. So I'm gonna go ahead and scratch this one out because we've completed this problem. I like to scratch problems out as I do them. And let's go to uh, another one. This one looks much more challenging. Um, let's work up to that one though. Let's do a little <laughs> one that's a little bit easier next. Uh, X approaches negative one of X squared minus one over X plus one. After this one, we'll do one that's a little bit more challenging. Um, again, if you plug in negative one, uh, you would get negative one squared minus one over negative one plus one. So negative one squared is one, so we get one minus one. Negative one plus one is zero, so you get zero over zero and everything falls apart. So again, does not work. So we need to do something else. And of course, that something else is going to be factoring. Recall the formula, a squared minus b squared, that's equal to parentheses, let's do a plus b times a minus b. I say let's do, because you can write the a minus b first, but I decided to write the a plus b first. You can, you know, multiplication is commutative. Some people memorize it as, as a minus b, a plus b. Some people memorize it as a plus b, a minus b. Okay, so since we're gonna apply this formula, we're thinking of the numerator here as x squared minus one squared. So a is your x and b is your one. So this is the limit. Notice again, I'm writing the limit sign as x approaches negative one and it'll be a plus b, so it'll be x plus one times x minus one, all divided by x plus one, really good stuff. And again, notice um, that I've written the limit sign, so super, super key to write that limit sign. Then boom, look at this, the magic happens. You get some beautiful cancellation, so this is the limit. As x approaches negative one, I really like this green, it's a really nice color. It's really like bright and yeah, anyways, X minus one. <laughs> All right, we're in a good place. We can plug in the number. So we drop the limit sign, plug in that negative one. So we get negative one minus one. So we get negative two. And now we're really doing calculus, right? So we've done, we've done three examples so far. Let's just recap what we've done. You know, the first example was a really easy one using our golden rule. If you can plug in the number and you get an answer, go for it. If it does not work, try something else. So we plugged in one, we got an answer. Easy, right? Just make sure you drop the limit sign when you plug in the number, that is so important. And these two examples, we used a similar technique. So factoring, so same technique in both examples. In the first example, we factored out a greatest common factor from the numerator, so just the x. And then we got to a point where we were able to plug in the zero, we did that, then we dropped the limit sign. In the second example, uh, it was still pretty easy, uh, although slightly more sophisticated. We had to use the difference of squares formula. Let's do another one. And in this example, um, things are going to be a little bit more interesting. Let's switch colors. Let's go to like a, a blue here. Oh, let me scratch out the problem because I have a list of problems. And so uh, which one did we do? All right, so I scratched that one out. Let's try, let's try this one. Uh, looks a little bit more interesting. Let's take the limit. As x approaches, um, uh, let's do this one, two, of x cubed minus eight over x minus two. So this one can be very challenging because, well, you'll see. <laughs> so again, first rule is you plug in the number. So we get two cubed minus eight over two minus two. Well, two cubed is eight, so you get eight minus eight over two minus two. So you get zero over zero and the world ends. Uh, hopefully not, but it doesn't work, right? So we have to do something else. So that something else is of course factor and we have the difference of cubes formula. So a cubed minus b cubed. Actually, I'm gonna show you both. I know it's not really important for this problem, but let me show you how I memorize these formulas because I think, I think it's gonna help you. So the way I memorize the difference of cube formula is it's the same sign, 
So it's a minus b, then it's always a squared, and then you switch the sign, okay? So it's plus b squared, plus a, plus a b, plus b squared. So switch the sign. So keep the sign, switch the sign. Keep the sign, switch the sign. A common mistake maybe is you might think it's plus 2ab. That's another formula um, for something that's called um, a perfect square trinomial. Uh, but here it doesn't have the 2. And then for this one, for the sum of cubes, you keep the sign. And then you switch the sign. Okay, so... So keep the sign, switch the sign. I think I might have misspoke. This is the difference of cubes, and this is the sum of cubes, okay? So this formula here is the difference of cubes formula, and this one is the sum of cubes formula. So in this particular problem, we have x cubed minus 8. So we have the limit as x approaches 2, and our a here is x, and 8, we can think of that as 2 cubed. So we're using this first formula here. So it'll be x minus two, that's the a minus b. And then a squared is x squared. And then plus a b, so that'll be plus two x. So plus two x. And then plus two squared, so plus four. All of this, all of it, every little bit is divided by x minus two. So very useful to memorize these formulas. Hopefully this has helped you a little bit. Keep the sign, switch the sign, keep the sign, switch the sign. And it's always a plus at the end. Notice the similarities in the formulas. So here a was x, b was 2. So we did a minus b, x minus 2. a squared is x squared plus ab, that's 2x, check, plus b squared, check. Boom, goes away. So this is equal to the limit as x approaches 2. And then here we have parentheses x squared plus 2x plus 4. Okay, very good. And at this point we can plug in the 2. <laughs> so all is good. So this will be, uh, let's see, 2 squared plus 2 times 2. This is where I usually mess up, <laughs> adding up the numbers. Oh, yeah, so funny. Uh, so many mistakes here. Plus 4, a 4, plus 4, plus 4. So we get the answer of 12. And so that would be the answer. And as always, I'm going to scratch out the problem I just did so I don't do it again. Right, so that's another example of factoring, right? Another example of factoring. All kinds of ways to find limits. Let's work out this example. So we have the limit as x approaches 4. And then in the numerator, we have the square root of x plus 5 minus 3. And in the denominator, we have x minus 4. So the rule is, if you can plug in the number and you get an answer, go for it. But as you can see, if we plug in 4 here on the bottom, we end up getting 0 on the bottom because 4 minus 4 is 0. So we need to do something else. So that something else uh, is called rationalizing. I'm going to show you how to do that. So we'll start by writing down the problem again. So we have the limit as x approaches 4. And then we have this piece here, so the square root of x plus 5 minus 3, and it's all over x minus 4. Remember, it's really important to always write the limit sign until you take the limit. And then what we're going to do is we're going to multiply by 1 in a very, very clever way. Um, so we're going to multiply by the conjugate like this, parentheses square root x plus 5 and then you just switch the sign here, so make it a plus. And then you can't just multiply by this, right? So it's wrong. So the trick is you divide by it as well. So we get the square root of x plus 5 plus 3. All right, and then now we're going to invoke a very, very powerful formula. This is a formula called the difference of squares formula. It says if you have a minus b, times a plus b, this is equal to a squared minus b squared. So our a in this problem is the square root of x plus 5, and our b is 3. So this will be equal to, this is all equal, the limit as x approaches 4. And then it's just going to be a squared minus b squared in the numerator. So when you square this square root, 
it's going to go away. So we're just going to get x plus 5. And then minus, and then b squared, but we said b is 3, so minus 9. All divided by, we still have the x minus 4 here. And you want to be really careful. I, I've messed, us, messed this up before in the past myself. You want to not forget this bottom piece here. Square root x plus 5 plus 3. Very nice. So this is equal to the limit as x approaches 4. So 5 minus 9 is minus 4. So this is x minus 4 over, and then down here we have x minus 4, and then square root x plus 5, and then plus 3, plus 3. All right, so all looks good. Again, we, we saw the original question. Let me just do a little quick recap for you. And the reason you know to do this, by the way, is because whenever you have like a square root like this and you're adding or subtracting a number, um, you want to invoke this technique. This technique is called rationalizing the numerator, okay, rationalizing the numerator. So we're rationalizing the numerator and you do that by multiplying by the conjugate. You just change the sign and then divide by and then just use the difference of squares formula. We get here. Be really careful on the bottom. You definitely want to have that piece there. It's easy to forget it. And then you get to this point here. Now, this is where <laughs> this is where the magic happens. These cancel. So this is the limit as x approaches 4. And then we're just left with a 1 up top, which is cool. So 1 over. And then we have on the bottom here the square root of x plus 5 plus 3. And now we've finally reached a point where we can actually plug in the limit. So plug in the number, rather. So we're plugging in the number into this expression, so we drop the limit sign. So we have 1 over the square root of 4 plus 5 plus 3. So we plug in the number into our function here, and this is equal to 1 over 4 plus 5 is 9, so you get the square root of 9 plus 3. And the square root of 9 is 3, so this is 1 over 3 plus 3. This is 1 over 6, and so that would be um, the answer. Let's discuss two special limits that come up a lot in calculus. So the first one comes up quite a bit. It's the limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x. And this is basically something you want to memorize. This is equal to 1. Okay, so super important, um, super useful to know this. Uh, totally worth uh, memorizing if you are studying calculus. The other one is also important. It doesn't come up as often. It's the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine x over x. And this is equal to 0. So this is also an important one, but it doesn't come up as often in like the exercises. So if you're taking, um, let's say, a calculus class, um, you're not going to see this as much as you are this one. Okay, so let's go ahead and do a bunch of examples practicing using these special limits. And they're not hard to use, but they do require a little bit of, what's the word I'm looking for? Finesse. <laughs> so let's start off with a simple example. I can just make some up. Let's see the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of 2x over x. So we have to find uh, this limit. So first, let me say what not to do. So a very common mistake is people think that you can pull out the 2. You cannot pull out numbers from the sine function or the cosine function, right? This is, this is wrong. So sine 2x equals 2 sine x. This is super bad. So you can't pull numbers out. So just something that needs to be said right away so that there's no confusion. So in this formula here, you have sine x over x. So the key point here is that this is the same as this. So here in this problem, we have a 2x and we have an x, but they're not the same. So what we would like to do is we would like to make them the same. So here's how we're going to do that. This is the limit as x approaches 0 of sine 2x. Okay, And then here's the trick. We really want the bottom to be a 2x. We want them to be the same. So what do you do? Well, you, <laughs> you just put the 2 there, because you can do whatever you want as long as you fix it later. 
See, so these aren't equal, right? This is wrong because this has a two and this doesn't. So what you do is you put a two here on the outside. And that's okay because what's happening is basically, you're basically multiplying by one, right? Uh, this is really two over one. So two over one, and then you have a two down here. They're gonna cancel, so nothing has really happened. Uh, except now it matches this formula. And so now you see that this matches this basically because as the x approaches zero, 2x also approaches zero. So this is this piece is going to zero and this piece is going to zero. We have a sine function here. So this whole expression is equal to one. This limit is equal to one. This is two times one, which is two. Now, if you're not convinced, if you're not convinced what you can do, so alt solution. And this is not something I do, but I've seen other people do it. And so I'm just gonna show you so you know how to do it. So when you get to this point here, where you have two times limit x approaches zero of sine two x over two x, you can make a substitution, right? You can say, you can say, hey, let's set u equal to two x, okay? And then note, note as x approaches zero, u, which is equal to 2x, right? It's two times zero. So u also approaches zero because it's two times, it's two times a number that's approaching zero. So it's going to approach zero also. So you can take your limit that you have here. Okay, you can take this and you can write it as follows. Two parentheses limit u approaching zero of sine u over u. It's worth seeing this, even if you think it's harder, and I do think it's harder, it's more work. Why would you do this? But you can make a substitution. It's something you can do when you're evaluating limit problems. A lot of people don't do that and they don't see that in the calculus course because most of the time when you're doing limits, you're not making substitutions, but you can do it. And so now you see that you can do it. And now it matches our formula. Up here, our formula was x approaching zero, sine x over x equals one, right? So um, yes, yeah, we're just changing the variable from x to u. So it matches the formula perfectly. So now it's two times one, which is two. So this is a, a better way to do it perhaps, but uh, I don't think it's necessary. Personally, I just do it like this. And then I make a note and say, hey, wait a minute, this is approaching zero. This is approaching zero. We have a sine function. The formula applies, right? So we can do it. Um, let's do another one. Let's do another one. And we're going to avoid this method from now on uh, simply because I, th I, th <laughs> I think most people don't do it that way. All right, let's do another one. Limit, uh, x approaches zero of, let's just do sine three x. And this time I'm gonna put a two x here on the bottom. So it's already there, it's already there. By the way, in all of these, which, which I should mention, um, the reason we have these special limits is because if you try to plug in zero into any of these, it's, it's not going to work, okay? So we just end up memorizing these results and applying these results to other problems. Okay, so here uh, we have sine three x over two x. So if we want to use our matching formula, this down here needs to be a three, right? Because remember the formula is limit x approaches zero of sine x over x equals one. I'm just gonna write it here for you in case you forgot. So that's the one we're using. So here um, we need a three down here. So let me just show you how I do it. I do it like this, limit x approaches zero. So we have sine three x, well, we, we have to keep that. Right? We can't change that. And then on the bottom, well, we know if we want to apply this formula, it has to match, right? So what do you do? You just do whatever you want and you fix it later. So this is three x. This, this same technique, by the way, of doing this and fixing it later, applies to so many other things in mathematics. Later on, you'll, if you'll learn, you keep studying mathematics, you'll learn about um, power series, Laurent series, Laplace transforms. There's problems in all of those areas in math where this technique of, of writing down what you want and fixing it later applies. So it's a good way to think, at least in my opinion. So sine 3x over 3x. Now what you can do is say, hey, wait a minute. Um, I just put a three there, I gotta take it away. What about the two? You can factor it out. Boom, right? So think about what just happened here. So let me just do it again. Let me just do it again. 
you want a 3x there, so you put it there. You say, oh, that's wrong. You can't just put it there. So you got to take it away. And then the two, you pull it out on the bottom. So now you see the three cancels. If you were to multiply this back into the limit, the threes would cancel and you would have a two on the bottom. Beautiful. And so now this expression here, this limit rather, is one by our formula. This is three halves times one, which is equal to three halves. Beautiful. Let's, let's switch gears now and let's do an example for the other one. And I don't have one off the top of my head, so I have a list of problems here. So I'm going to see if I can find one uh, where we can use the other formula. Let me just take a look here. Uh, let's see. Let's take a look. Yeah, this one's okay. So here's one. Limit. Uh, X approaches zero. Uh, this one is one minus cosine X squared over x. So we have this one here. We should be able to do this pretty easily. So the other formula, okay, the other formula, again, it doesn't come up that often. Um, the other formula was this. It was the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine x over x, and this is equal to 0. Okay, this is the formula we had at the very beginning. Let me just scroll up and refresh your memory where it was. It was at the very beginning of our discussion. So it's this other limit, which again is important, but it just doesn't come up as often in courses that are taught, you know, uh, calculus courses. All right. So here we kind of have that, but we have an extra factor of one minus cosine x. So what I'm thinking is we can write it like this. This is the limit as x approaches zero. We can write this as one minus cosine x. over x times, and then we still have a one minus cosine x over here. It's really over one, okay? So it's really like this, right? It's really the same thing. Um, I typically don't do that though. I'll just write it like this normally. You know, it's over one. Or if you like, what you can do is you can write it like this, even better, right? It's understood that it's over one. So now it's like a separate quantity. It's like, it's like this times this. And whenever you have the product of limits, by the way, as long as both pieces uh, exist, you can just multiply them. So let's actually break it up. Let's actually break it up. You can write this as the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine x over x. And then you can write it as a product of limits times limit x approaches 0, 1 minus cosine x. You can do that. I usually don't do this, but I wanted to show you that you can, right? Basically, as long as this exists and this exists, like if these are both limits, they're, if they're both equal to a number, you're good, right? So this is an unnecessary step, but just in case. And then this one here, via the formula, it's going to be zero times. And then this one here, we can just plug in the zero. So we drop the limit sign. So it's one minus the cosine of zero. Okay, so this is going to be equal to 0 times uh, 1 minus cosine of 0 is 1, right? It's the x-coordinate on the unit circle at 0. Uh, and then this is uh, 0 times 0, so it's 0. Super clean, super simple. Let's go ahead and do uh, one more just for practice. Um, let's, let's raise the bar a little bit. Uh, this one's typically found in books. I'll make one up. It's something like this usually they usually throw this in a lot of textbooks maybe something like sine 3x over sine 4x i'm sure you're starting to see a pattern now by the way the answer here was going to be 3 over 4 right uh over here you saw the answer was uh 3 over 2 <laughs> this is what happens and then the answer here is 2 over 1 right there's a 1 here see 2 over 1 2 boom 3 over 2, boom. But the thing is, you, you, it's important to show the work. So people recognize this pattern and they start to think, oh, you can pull the numbers out. That's not really what's happening. All right, so for this one, we're going to use our super powerful formula. I'll write it in red. The limit as x approaches 0 of sine x over x. And this is equal to 1. This is the one we're going to use. This one takes a little bit of work. Usually books will give you a hint. Um, when they give you a problem like this. There's no hint in this video. Uh, I'm just going to show you how to do it. <laughs> All right, so this is the limit as x approaches 0. 
And we're gonna do it the same way we did the other ones. So we're just gonna write down what we want and fix it later. And that's just, in my opinion, that's the best way. So sine 3x, well, that's cool, right? We have that. But what we really want is a 3x down here. So what do we do? We put it there, right? We do whatever we want. So that's the numerator, but we gotta fix it. So I'm gonna put a 3x here. Boom, goes away. See that? So you write down the 3x, you see, because that's what you want, and then you put this here to fix it, because it's really 3x over 1, right? I won't write the 1, but it's really, really over 1. It's really this, but I'm going to eliminate that. On the bottom, we have sine 4x. Sine 4x, so you write it down, and then, well, what do we want there? Well, we want a 4x. We want it to match, right? So you want it to match, so that's what you write. And then over here, you put the 4x. Boom. You see, so you write down what you want, fix it later. Write down what you want, fix it later. And that's just uh, a way, at least that's how my mind thinks. And these X's are going to cancel. Boom, boom. The three-fourths, you can pull it out. This is three-fourths times the limit as X approaches zero. And then here um, we have this limit up top. I'm going to show an extra step. I'm going to show an extra step here. Three X. And then on the bottom, we have um, sine 4x over 4x. And the extra step I'm going to show, I don't really need to show it, because, but I'll, I will. This is going to be 1, and this is going to be 1. But if you really want to, if you really want to do it, you can do this. I'm going to show you 3 fourths times limit x approaches 0 of sine of 3x over 3x and that's the numerator right what a beast <laughs> in the denominator we have the limit as x approaches 0 of sine 4x over 4x another beast look at that what a ridiculous monster it's beautiful this is 3 fourths times we know that this is going to be 1 by our super powerful formula up there same thing on the bottom, so it's 1 over 1. Whoops, 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 1 over 1. 3 times 1 is 3, 4 times 1 is 4, we get 3 fourths, which we knew by our super cheap rule at the beginning, um, it's going to be 3 over 4. Personally, I don't take it this far, like if I'm doing this and I'm showing, well, I am showing you how to do it, I hope so. Um, another way is just like this. This is probably sufficient in my mind. I don't think this is a necessary step, but people have different opinions. Yeah, so those are the two special formulas. I think with these examples, um, you know, we, we did a really easy one. So that one was really easy. And then we did one over here. It was a little bit harder because it had a number here. Then we did a simple one where we applied the other formula. And then um, you have this one here, which is typically in most calculus books have a problem like this. And they'll usually like give a hint or something because it's pretty tough to figure out on your own if you've never seen it. Let's talk about the squeeze theorem. By the way, this is also called the pinching theorem, and it's also called the sandwich theorem. So first I'll state the theorem, and then we're going to do some examples to show you how to actually use it. So the squeeze theorem says the following. It says, suppose that uh, we have two conditions. So I'm going to phrase it in my own words. The first condition is that uh, I guess I'll use h of x is less than or equal to f of x, which is less than or equal to, say, g of x. And let's just say this is for all x in some interval. So in some interval containing c. And this, this doesn't actually have to be true at c. So I'll say except possibly at C itself. So except possibly at C itself. So you have this inequality. And the second condition is that you have some limits. So let's see. So basically if the limit as H, uh, the limit of H as X approaches C exists. So we have the limit of h of x as x approaches c, let's say it's equal to l, 
And let's say this one also approaches L. So the limit as x approaches c of g of x is L. Then we have the following. So basically what's happening is we have this function here f and it's being squeezed between these two other functions between h and g. So it's trapped in the middle. And then as x approaches c, uh, this one approaches L. And then this one approaches L. But this one's trapped in the middle, so it must also approach L. So that's what the squeeze theorem says. So then we have these two conditions. Then the limit of f of x as x approaches c is also equal to L. So basically, if we have this function and it's squeezed between these other two functions or pinched or sandwiched, I don't know why they use that word, uh, then if these other functions approach an equal limit, so it's L in both cases where L is a real number, then the limit of f is also going to be equal to L. So let's just do an example um, of this. And this is you know, typically taught in um, you know, Calc 1 courses, uh, depending on you know, where you take the course and who your teacher is. Um, you know, the level of difficulty will vary. A lot of times they'll just give you the inequality. Um, let's force ourselves to have to come up with it. Let's make it harder. And it's not that hard, but let's just raise the bar just a little bit. Let's find this limit here. Let's say x approaches zero of classic example, x times the sine of one over x. Classic example here. So let's evaluate uh, this limit here. I love this theorem. So if you plug in zero, obviously it doesn't work because uh, you have one over zero here inside the sine function. So it's a huge epic failure. So we have to create uh, this inequality, right? And there's a couple ways to do it. Um, you can invoke the absolute value function. You can use that. I used to always do it that way, but then I realized that a lot of people had a hard time understanding that. So I'm going to do it a different way. So note, in general, in general, you have the following inequalities. If you remember from trig, uh, the range of the sine function uh, is from negative one to one inclusive. Same thing with cosine. So sine x is less than or equal to one and greater or equal to negative one. And this is for all x, right, for all x. Remember, sine is defined on the entire real line. So this is true for all x. So here, uh, we're gonna start by using this on this here. So I'm gonna write this, sine of one over x is less than or equal to one and greater than or equal to negative one. Okay, this is one way to do it. So you start by, by basically uh, writing down a lower bound and an upper bound. This is called an upper bound. This is called a lower bound uh, for the sine function. Then you say, hey, wait a minute, um, I'm missing an x, right? Because there's an x in the problem. So what you do is you multiply all of this by x. This is negative x less than or equal to x sine one over x less than or equal to x. I basically start here. This is, so if I was doing this on my own, like if I was like, you know, speed doing this problem, like if I wasn't making a video and showing other people in the world how to do it, I would start with this. This is how I do it. So you can just start here. Uh, and then now you just have a formality, right? Because you've, you, you have your inequality, right? Your function's in the middle. That's what you care about. And you have these other functions here. So now you just have to show that they approach L. So what's L? <laughs> well, it's pretty easy because X is approaching zero. So let's, let's find out. So we have to take the limit here, the limit as X approaches zero of negative X. Well, what is this? Well, you can just plug in zero. And remember when you do that, that's when you drop the limit signs. This is minus zero. And so that's equal to zero. Good stuff. And then you do this one, the limit as X approaches zero of X. Again, you plug in the zero, you drop the limit sign, so you get zero. So basically, this approach is zero, this approach is zero. So by the squeeze theorem, this should also approach zero. So you just have to write it down. So thus, therefore, hence, thus, by the, here's where you can have fun. You can say pinching, but I'm not gonna do it. By the squeeze theorem, by the squeeze theorem, uh, our original limit, so if you're lazy, you can just say our OG limit, but I'll say the limit as x approaches zero of x times the sine of one over x is equal to zero. This is almost like a little proof, so if you want, you can put like a little QED 
uh, but I'll put a little box with an X. So yeah, that's the Swiss theorem. So simple example. Let, let's go ahead and do another one. Why not? Just so you can get some more practice. I'm going to switch colors. Let's go to orange. Yeah, orange is okay. I need, I need, to, I need some new colors. Let's go back to green. Limit. As X approaches zero, usually it's zero. You can change it to where it's not zero, but this is a pretty easy example. Let's do X squared cosine of, uh, oh, we're in the year 2022, right? So 2022 over X to the, let's be silly, 2021, that was last year. <laughs> so if you plug in zero here, it's also not gonna work because you get cosine of 2022 over zero to the 2021, you're gonna get division by zero, so it's not gonna work. So this time, since it's our second example, I'm gonna show you the way I would do it. I'm just gonna do it the way I do it. So we know that this is a squeeze theorem problem, and so how do you know that? Experience, so whenever you have like x times a sign and there's some issue like this, like two over x, three over x squared, or x times a cosine, same issue, you can apply this, this technique, which you've, you're seeing here in this video. Um, just like before, Sine is between negative one and one. We can do the same thing with cosine. So, so just I'll write it in a different color over here. Cosine of x is less than or equal to one and greater or equal to negative one. And this is for all x, right? This is for all x. So here I'm gonna start by just taking this whole thing. x squared cosine of 2022 over x to the 2021, okay? And this is less than or equal to, it's less than or equal to, so we know that the cosine is less than or equal to one. So this is less than or equal to x squared times one, which is x squared. Again, the cosine piece is less than or equal to one by this inequality here. So this is less than or equal to x squared times one, which is x squared. That's how I do it. Saves writing greater than or equal to, I'm reading it backwards, <laughs> right? It's greater than or equal to, even though it's a less than or equal to sign, I'm reading it backwards. So cosine is greater than or equal to negative one, but it's being multiplied by this. So it's greater than or equal to negative x squared. You see how that's the, the thought process. That's the key stuff, right? That's the stuff that really helps people. Okay, so now we can take the limits. So we just, this is obviously gonna go to zero. This is obviously gonna go to zero. Therefore, what's in the middle is going to go to zero by the squeeze theorem. So now we just have to say that I'm going to switch to yellow. So the limit as x approaches zero of this piece here, negative x squared. If we plug in zero here, we're going to get negative zero squared, which is zero. The limit, do this one now, as x approaches zero of x squared, if you plug in zero, you're just going to get zero. So so now we can say by the squeeze theorem, whatever is squeezed in the middle or pinched in the middle or sandwiched in the middle, its limit is also going to be zero. So thus, by the squeeze theorem, I'm gonna write squeeze theorem, uh, the limit as x approaches zero, Peter's slowing down here, my writing is a little slower, of x squared, there we go. My, my computer slowed down for a moment. I was writing uh, and it took a minute. I don't know if you saw that. It took a minute for uh, the pen to work. So I was like, oh, okay, let me slow down. Cosine of 2022 over x to the 2021 is equal to zero. Really cool. And there's other examples uh, besides these, but these are the ones that you typically find in books. like x times the sine function like this, sine one over x, or like x times um, the cosine function. So typical examples um, that you would see uh, in, in most calculus classes.